can't even look a young person in the eye unless I know I am doing everything possible to secure their future. One of the things that all governments must be accountable for is ensuring the health and the survival of future generations. The youth understand and are bold enough to take the initiative and the leadership to say, we have laws in place that protect our future. Now, judiciary, interpret them and protect our rights. I didn't want my grandchildren to say that Opa understood what was happening, but he didn't make it clear. In 1981, I wrote a paper on climate change and said we cannot burn all of the fossil fuels, that we would create a completely different planet if we burned it all. The impacts that I think are the most important are those which are irreversible on any time scales that humans would care about. And that temperature has, of course, continued to go up, and each decade has been warmer than the one before. As we get stronger greenhouse warming of the surface, that causes more heat waves and drought, but it also causes the atmosphere to hold more water vapor. We can see things happening now. For example, the fires. The 100-year flood is no longer occurring just once every 100 years. The Arctic sea ice is receding rapidly. Glaciers and mountains all around the world are melting. And we know from the Earth's history that with increasing greenhouse gases, we will get sea level rise of several meters. Coastal cities all around the world would be affected. We've continued down that pathway where we're developing every fossil fuel we can find. And the changes will be much bigger in coming decades. What uh, drove me to change from doing pure science to speaking out about it was the fact that I had both children and grandchildren, and I decided I didn't want them to say that their grandfather understood what was happening, but he didn't make it clear. And I thought it would be easy to make it clear. It's easy in the sense that the scientific community now agrees, but getting governments to take sensible actions is much more difficult than I imagined it would be. Oh, oh no, you beat me. <laughs> I grew up on the Columbia. I learned from my father exactly which tree was my grandmother's favorite. I felt like I knew her because I knew her plum tree. And when I take my children to that plum tree and we pick those plums, not any time goes by that I don't tell them about their great-grandmother. And so they know her through that plum tree as well. And I'm always grateful that my ancestors saved this special place for us. They deserve their legacy, just as I deserve my legacy. When Hurricane Katrina hit, it was so devastating that I began to read climate science, particularly Jim Hansen's work. It was very clear that this is the most urgent matter of our lifetime. And so that's when I began to start tailoring my legal work to climate crisis. The public trust doctrine is the oldest concept of environmental law, an obligation of government to protect the resources for present and future generations of citizens. It is completely geared towards protecting those societal needs that support human dignity, human comfort, and human survival.
And so after uh, Hurricane Katrina hit and climate crisis really came to the forefront, I thought, why aren't they focusing more on what the public trust means? People ask me what natural resources are protected under the public trust doctrine. There's the stream beds, the rivers, the wildlife, the tidelands. The reason those are protected is because they are so integral to society. And then you can just look at some beautiful, look how beautiful they stay. I realize the public trust protects all natural resources that have a critical impact on society, and that certainly includes air and atmosphere. It is the linchpin resource that controls everything else because it is absolutely key to human survival. If everybody can realize there's a legal duty of protection for the atmosphere that is property of present and future generations, then courts can enforce that. When I spoke to Mary Wood, I had read some related things about the way our founding fathers looked at what amounted to the trust concept because Thomas Jefferson and James Madison has, had exchanged uh, letters in which they thought that the current generation then should preserve the fertility of the soils for the next generation. And that, they felt, was an obligation. And that's very similar to the idea that the present generation needs to uh, preserve the climate for the next generation. In order to stabilize the climate, we have to reduce the atmospheric carbon dioxide from the present amount to about 350 parts per million. Well, that's a tall order. It requires both reducing fossil fuel use, but also restoring some of the carbon to the biosphere and the soils that has been released over the last century or two. We have shown from climate studies that if we wait 10 years before we begin, then we would need to reduce emissions 15% a year, which is just implausible. That's why it is urgent that we begin to reduce the emissions soon so that it's feasible to stabilize the climate. My late grandfather taught me from a very early age to not just appreciate nature in terms of aesthetics, but also, uh, you know, its inherent value. The atmosphere, without it, we wouldn't last literally for more than a few minutes, right? So, uh, so we absolutely need the atmosphere to survive. I was brought on board at the Goddard Institute to study the human dimensions of the global carbon cycle. I got involved with Jim because he was also focused not just on the problem side but the solution side of the issue. I and many other climate scientists believe that uh, we're already in what we consider the dangerous zone, meaning that uh, even if we keep things exactly as they are in terms of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere, that will still lead to uh, very damaging impacts on both human society and natural ecosystems uh, down the road. There's still good basis for optimism, but the window of time is shrinking. We need to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions immediately and by as much as we can. Each year we wait, it becomes much, much harder to reduce CO2 emissions for one thing, but secondly, it becomes far more costly, and economic studies have shown this time and time again. Like the means are there, like what's missing is the will. Our government and most governments around the world are doing woefully little to actually show that uh, they mean what they say when they, when they say they want to make an impact in terms of reducing climate change and potential disastrous impacts in the future. I remember when I really first started thinking about climate change came from my dad. 
My father was a tremendous inspiration to me growing up. He's been teaching for almost 50 years, um, and he's really one of the founders of environmental law. He was reading what the scientists were saying about climate change, and I remember him telling me, you know, climate change is a game changer. This is going to be the biggest challenge that you will ever face. And I think all of the scientists, all of the attorneys would agree that it's probably the most complex problem that this world has ever faced. But it's not impossible. The best description of what I've seen as an attorney comes from my children's children books. What does your daddy and mommy do each day? A baker bakes bread, a fireman puts out fire, and a lawyer solves problems. And I really take that seriously. As an attorney, it's my obligation to make sure that we are taking action to solve this climate crisis. Hopefully, I'm, I'm doing a good enough job to make sure that their voices are heard in the judicial system, because the judges need to hear this. We stand to lose everything this country was built on, American security, the resources, and we stand to lose a lot of human life. That is why atmospheric trust litigation is so needed. On May 4th, 2011, there was a hatch of ATL petitions and lawsuits across every state in this country. And that's never been done in the history of law. One group of actions across every single state saying the same thing, all brought by youth plaintiffs, making the same demand on government. Youth are asserting that the atmosphere is shared in common by them and by future generations, and that the governments have the obligation to protect it. It's about giving voice to these children who are going to be affected by climate change. Scientists have been working very hard and they understand what is needed for us to have a healthy atmosphere. And we're asking that the court adopt what the scientists are recommending that we do. And that's that we cap our emissions in a particular year by a certain percentage so that we will get to the point where we have a healthy atmosphere. The scientists have raised the alarm and they're telling us that the time is now for us to act. It's not going to be convenient. Uh, but the science should not be based on what is convenient. We have to say what is actually necessary. If you look at our Congress, it is well oiled and coal fired. It's very difficult to get members of Congress to vote for what would be in the best interests of the public. Uh, when they are so well paid by the fossil fuel industry. Our Declaration of Independence and Constitution, the principle that all people are created equal, the basis for civil rights actions is also relevant to young people. Or young people are people and they should have equal rights. So it's great to bring in the judiciary because they're the ones who are independent enough to force the other branches to actually take meaningful action that's uh, in line with the best available science. This public trust doctrine is a fundamental citizen right. If we were invaded by some foreign nation, government would have the obligation to act. There would be a clear threat. And climate now is just as clear a threat to our children's future. Trust is a profound obligation. It is, a, it is all that the youth have today. They have trust in government, and they have trust in their parents, and they have trust in their communities. There will be a judge who will rule in favor of these youth plaintiffs because that judge will realize 
the crucial window of time that we sit in. The only question in my mind is, will this be in time?